I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, my name's Hutch Huddleston, and I'm one of the joint replacement surgeons here at Stanford. And uh, in addition to the QA at the end, I would say please feel free to interrupt me uh, if questions come up. I'd like to make this informal, and it's always uh, more interesting for us if you guys are involved uh, in the discussion rather than me just telling you what my thoughts are. So um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the quality movement in orthopedic surgery uh, and specifically with how that uh, has ramifications for total joint arthroplasty, primarily hip replacement and knee replacement. Can you, you can't hear me? I can't quite hear you in the back. Do you want me to turn this up? No, it's not, no, it's not that. It's just you, I'm afraid you're going to have to oh. try and project. OK. I'll do the best that I can. Uh, all right, great. So uh, as most of you probably have heard, there are uh, sweeping changes coming uh, for the delivery of health care. Uh, and um, hip and knee replacement represents approximately 10% of Medicare's budget. And uh, because we represent 10% of the budget, uh, it, we're number one on the chopping block, so to speak in terms of the government's uh, way of controlling costs. So uh, when, we, when we talk about health care reform, in essence, what we've seen so far is really payment reform. And physicians are the ones who are going to take the brunt of that. Uh, and so part of our mission is to try to preserve access to our patients. Hip and knee replacement are arguably two of the most effective medical interventions of all time. And we would like to be able to continue to do that uh, for uh, patients. So that's what we're actively fighting for. Um, some of my older colleagues are, are not quite pleased with what's going on and uh, they want to put their head in the sand and, and just hope that it doesn't get too bad before they finish things up. Uh, for those of us on the younger side, um, we view it quite differently. I, I view this as a very exciting time. Uh, the people who are creating the change are actually engaging us to be involved in that change and, and I find that very uh, rewarding. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how we're trying to shape the quality movement and uh, try to preserve access for you all for hip and knee replacements. <clears throat> so this is my disclosure and uh, I essentially just want to get the point across, don't shoot the messenger, okay? <laughs> Uh, I give this presentation to my colleagues as well, and uh, some of them uh, leave after about 10 minutes, so hopefully you all will stay. Uh, so you may, some of you may have seen uh, this slide before, but uh, essentially it's Gary Harden. It says, I was close to a breakthrough when the grant money ran out, and you can see here uh, he's got about half a wheel. So that's kind of how a lot of us feel uh, in the healthcare world, especially with, with hip and knee replacement right now. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to fix things before the money runs out, but it's getting close, at least we're told that's the case. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the actual problem is and why we need uh, to rein in costs for healthcare spending. I'm going to uh, preface that with trying to show you what we get for our dollar in healthcare spending compared to uh, much of the world. And you'll see it's quite pitiful. Um, and then I'm going to talk about different strategies to address the problem and how to improve the environment uh, and essentially to I increase uh, the value of our services. And I will frame that discussion uh, from the eyes of payers, uh, from patients, from providers, and uh, hospitals, because all of us have a dog in the fight, so to speak, and all of us can make contributions here. So I uh, got interested in the quality movement uh, based on uh, one of the things that I learned early on in my training was that there was a wide variation of care. And I, I had the luxury of training, uh, or in, and the privilege, I should say, of training at, at a world-famous institution in Boston called Massachusetts General Hospital, where uh, I really thought people were getting great care. Um, and we rotated all the different Boston teaching hospitals, Children's Hospital Boston and Brigham Women's, and it's no different here, but I, I was still surprised by the variation in care that I saw, and I always saw room for improvement, and that bothered me right from the beginning. So quality is something I've always been interested in. I've been in practice now, this is the end of my eighth year here, and uh, over the first three years when I was here, uh, I uh, had quite an interesting mix of patients, and uh, many tertiary academic surgeons uh, see a lot of what we call revision surgery. So we fix the problems in joint replacements uh, that other people have created. And that's uh, to be expected and it's one of the things that I like. That's why I took a job like this and was trained the way I was. Um, but w we saw a rash of cases coming in with people trying to do what they said was minimally invasive surgery. And I, I thought to myself, this is really a dishonest marketing campaign. People are saying, oh, we're going to do minimally invasive surgery and essentially we're going to take the exact same size prosthesis we're going to do essentially the exact same operation under the skin, but we're going to make a small skin incision. We're going to stretch the heck out of everything, and we're going to call it minimally invasive surgery, and we're going to see what happens. So it can be done. And at the time when it was being marketed, especially around here, there was no data to show that it was really minimally invasive 
or any more effective or, for that matter, safe, which is the most important thing. And uh, what I was seeing with the rash uh, of failures, early failures, less than two years, coming into my office with people who really should have had a joint replacement and walked out on the street and not had to think about it again, having big problems, some of them which ruined their lives, that really bothered me. So that sort of galvanized my interest in this topic. And uh, this paper right here, Minimal Incision Surgery as a Risk Factor for Early Failure, just talks about that. Whereas if you had so-called minimally invasive knee replacement, uh, you had a 20 time chance of having to have your knee replacement redone in the first two years. And those are patients just from my practice here over the first three years. So I went on to write a bunch of different papers. We did essentially the same study in hips. And then I got uh, interested in a large Medicare data set uh, looking at complications. This was back in 2005. Uh, and we've done a lot of work in that regard. So uh, I do have some experience. And I, I think that you need data to get people to listen to you and to drive change. And we're actively working on that. So. How do we do in the United States for uh, what we spend on health care? And the answer is going to be not very good. So if you look at here, here is uh, per capita health care spending. All right. And uh, on this axis here is how much we spend. And then here are the different companies. And you can see the United States is almost twice what the average uh, cost is or, or spending per capita compared to the rest of uh, the countries here. And you can see there's essentially all industrialized countries. Okay, so per capita, we're not really getting much. We're spending more than anybody else, uh, and you're going to see what we're going to get in a second. So this is essentially the same information, but you'd like to be somewhere down here. And this is spending a share of GDP now. So it's not per capita, it's GDP. But you can still see for our GDP, we spend the most out of any industrialized country on health care. Uh, and the question is, what are we getting for it? So what are we getting for it is really hard to measure. And uh, if you were going to look at life expectancy as a surrogate for quality of care, which obviously that's debatable, but if you were going to look at that, uh, you can look at this graph here. And life expectancy is here uh, on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is per capita health care spending. And so if you say that the care that you're giving should translate to an increased life expectancy, uh, you'd want to be somewhere down here in terms of the best value, which we define as is quality over cost, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the United States is way out here as an outlier. So we're spending the most to get this life expectancy, whereas people are spending much uh, less and getting similar life expectancy. Singapore's is greater. Even Cuba here is spending much, much less than we are, and the life expectancy is essentially the same as it is in the United States. Okay, it's separated by 90 miles of ocean. Okay. So we can do better, and there's no question. So let's drill down a little bit. OK, and here's an international comparison of spending on health from 1980 to 2007, so 27 years, long time. And these are essentially our sister countries. And this essentially conveys the same message. So this is average spending uh, on health care per capita. And you can see the United States is way above everybody else here. These are the countries, Canada, Netherlands, Germany, Australia, UK, and New Zealand. So we're spending much, much more. And the same thing, if you look at it compared to what percentage of GDP it is, the United States is up here at 16%. Uh, and all the other countries are down here between 4 and 8%. So we spend much more per person. And we spend a much larger uh, percentage of our gross domestic product on what uh, we're trying to achieve. So does that give us better outcomes? I'm not quite sure. So why do things cost so much here? And that's really a million dollar question. But uh, this is an article from one of our main journals here, which uh, attributed the rising costs to multiple factors. But uh, amongst the most uh, important ones were an increased administrative burden. So there's a, a tremendous amount of paperwork involved in healthcare now. Uh, for everybody who's been a patient, just from the patient's perspective, you can appreciate that. From our perspective as providers, it's absolutely overwhelming. Uh, inefficient care doesn't help. We, we really have poorly coordinated care in a lot of areas. Uh, litigation is troublesome. An aging population means that uh, older people are going to most likely require more resources. And then technological advances, which is a big driver of cost. So if you are a uh, publicly traded company and you create a, a hip or a knee replacement, uh, you need to maintain your market share. And unfortunately, that translates to having new things. Uh, and there are lots of ways to change uh, hip and knee replacement. But any changes in something that already works very, very well is prone to be problematic. So it's just like having uh, a new car every couple of years. Uh, having a new knee replacement or a new hip replacement every couple of years, it's going to cost more. And they're going to charge more because the company says it's new. But the question is, is it any better? And the answer is probably no at this point. Both operations, especially hip replacement, uh, work very, very well. If you poll hip replacement patients afterwards, uh, about 95 plus percent of them are overwhelmingly satisfied with the result of the operation. 
knee replacement, not quite as good, about 80%. But anyways, the, my point is the operations work well. So we don't need so many technological advances uh, for hip and knee replacement anymore. What, what we need to, to affect is the system of delivery of care. All right, so let's drill down a little bit more. So here's overall healthcare rankings and uh, expenditures compared to our sister countries. All right, and in terms of rankings, everybody would like to be in the green here, not the red. And if you look at the United States and all these things, this is overall quality of care, efficient care, safe care, coordinated care, patient-centered care. We actually got a yellow in patient-centered care, but you can see most of these are all red, okay? Access, efficiency, equity, uh, all red. So terrible rankings out of our seven sister countries. Okay, so spending a lot, not getting a lot in return. And interestingly enough, you'll see that uh, debt and healthcare spending uh, have very similar trajectories. So here's federal debt, okay, each year uh, from fiscal year 2007 projected all the way out to 2017. Slow rise, and if you look at healthcare costs, even greater rises here, so very similar. So as I said, hip and knee replacement, uh, when I made this slide, accounted for about, at the last figures, 8.5% of Medicare's budget. So, if you are the uh, major payer of healthcare in this country, the federal government, and you want to reduce your costs, you're going to start with the two procedures uh, that create uh, the most costs, and that's hip and knee replacement, and that's why uh, we are very interested in this. So let's just take a look at how uh, many people have problems with their musculoskeletal system. So uh, over the course of, of one's lifetime, in general, one out of four people will require uh, some sort of musculoskeletal care that's formal from a doctor, so 25%. So these <clears throat> direct and indirect costs per year, at least as of 2004, uh, you can see how much money this is, $849 billion. Okay, that's just, uh, arthritis is a lot of that, but that's just a tremendous amount of money just for musculoskeletal care. Um, and this rep represents 7.7% of our GDP, so a huge amount. Uh, and uh, that 7.7%, uh, if you look at that compared to what all of the healthcare spending currently is percentage of GDP, it's 17%. So it's almost half is spent on musculoskeletal care. And most of that is os treatment of osteoarthritis, but a plethora of other things as well. So arthritis is leading cause of disability and work limitations in the United States. So it's a big, big problem, and we spend lots of money on it. And the question are, are we getting uh, a good bang for our buck? So if you look at the arthritis care burden, well, what joints are the most effective? Uh, affected, I should say, and you'll see it's essentially knee and hip are number one and number two, and hand is not very far behind. You guys probably all know people who have had hip or knee replacements uh, or hand arthritis as well. And then if you look at, uh, so arthroplasty is a replacement of the joint uh, by mechanical means, and you can see total knee replacement is the most common of all the joint replacements that are done. Total hip replacement is number two, partial hip replacement, revision hip replacement, and so on, all the way down. Uh, to hands, but it's hip and knee replacement that make up the lion's share of that arthritis care burden, and that's what's driving a lot of the costs. If you look here at uh, uh, what's going on in terms of the prevalence of the procedure, so there has essentially been an explosion of the number of hip replacements and knee replacements done each year. And why that is is, uh, is hard to say. We'll look at, at that in a little bit. But <clears throat> this is essentially hip and knee replacements from 1992 up to 2006, and you can see right here this yellow line is total knee replacement. It starts going up. Slow, 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 slow here, and then all of a sudden it's rising exponentially. Okay, I can guarantee you that there was not any great breakthrough in the technology in this year when those procedures started to go up exponentially. And hip replacement here in blue is essentially doing the same thing, just not, not as much. And then here's mean hospitalization charges for hip knee replacement going up just as you would expect given the number of procedures that are going up. Okay, so the question is, what is driving this? Is it providers doing more procedures because they're getting paid less to actually do the operations, or are there more people who want them as the baby boomers get to the point where they qualify for the operation? It's hard to say, but there's no question. It's, a, it's due to a variety of factors. And uh, this is total hospitalization charges now for hip and knee replacement. So this is not what the costs are. This is what the hospital is actually charging the payers. And you can see for knee replacement and hip replacement, it's starting to go up exponentially. So the most recent figures for annual numbers of cases done in the United States, there's about 800,000 knee replacements done per year, and there's about 400,000 hip replacements done each year. The projections are for 2030 that there will be the need anyways. I don't know whether there will be anybody to pay for them, but there will be the need for 3.5 million knee replacements per year and 800,000 hip replacements. Okay, so the question is, is the money gonna be there? And the answer is no. And these are those pr predictions here. All right, so this is annual number of procedures in the United States, and this is knee replacement right here, 
and this is hip replacement and this is 2030. And for redo hip replacements, which is about half of what I spend my time doing, uh, you can see the curves are similar. So as you do more primary hip and knee replacements, you would expect more failures. That's not the way it's supposed to work. If the technology's gotten better over the years, there should be fewer failures, which there are indeed, but there's still so many procedures done that there are, are going to always be the need for people who uh, do revision hip and knee replacement. Part of the uh, increase in the numbers is due to an increase in demand. Um, so people these days in general, uh, especially the baby boomers, seem to be much less accepting of uh, disability with aging. So they want to try to maintain an active lifestyle. I can certainly understand that. Um, and uh, as of uh, this study, uh, which was uh, from 2009, they predicted that by 2011, uh, over 50% of the patients who were having a hip replacement in the United States would be less than 65. Okay, this operation was originally designed, as was knee replacement, so that Mrs. Jones could go out to the mailbox to get her mail by herself or with a cane and not have to have somebody else do it for her. And so this is the fact that this is where people are now getting the operation is quite a change. Um, and some of that is reflected in the satisfaction rates, especially for knee replacements, which the knee tends to be a more complicated joint than the hip joint, so it's a little bit harder to reproduce, and that's probably why the patients are a little bit less satisfied. But a lot of it has to do with what your preoperative expectations were. So if you think you're going to have a 20-year-old knee again after a knee replacement, that's not really going to be the case. It makes noise. Uh, it's a little bit sloppy. It feels unstable at times. It swells. It hurts a little bit when the weather's bad. So it's by no means perfect. A hip's a different story. But in our practice here at Stanford, uh, our average age for hip replacement is 57 years old, so even younger than this. So, and there are different causes of hip arthritis than knee, than knee arthritis. So knee osteoarthritis, for the most part, as far as we can tell right now, is a uh, wear and tear type of phenomenon, like the tire wearing out on your car. Hip replacements is a little bit different. It probably has to do with uh, an uh, anatomic abnormality with how you were born. Uh, and that probably starts the cascade. So that's, there are genetic clusters as well, and there probably are for knee. We don't understand them as well as hip. Uh, but, but the causes of the diseases are a little bit different, and that's why the prevalence of procedures done in the United States are probably different as well. So from a payer's perspective, if you look at uh, this operation, and this hip and knee replacement are considered preference-sensitive care. So it's an elective procedure. You don't ever have to have it. You can go home and bite a towel for the rest of your life and endure the pain. Okay, but it, it, it depends on, on whether you want to have it or not and what you want to get out of it. Okay? It's not a hip fracture. So if you have a hip fracture, you don't have a choice, really. If you have a hip fracture and we don't fix your fracture and you have to stay in bed, the chances of you dying in the first three months is about 30%, okay? from bed sores and pneumonias and everything else. So we fix people's hip fractures so they can get back up and try to get back to their normal life. Most people don't, okay? but some do. Hip and knee replacement are different, okay? This is an elective operation. It's tried to, to improve your quality of life. It's supposed to Im improve your ability to function and to reduce your pain. So when you do it is very preference sensitive. So arthritis is a spectrum of disease. And I have patients who have very little arthritis objectively on the x-rays. And x-rays are pretty objective. They are literally black and white. And they come in and they have been taking opiate pain medicine for a long time and they <coughs> have pain off the charts and pain that's really disproportionate to what we would expect based on their x-ray findings. And then we have patients who have no cartilage left in their knee at all. And uh, they come walking in without any assistive device at all. And usually uh, their children bring them in and say, mom or dad isn't doing so well and they have a lot of pain, but they're not going to tell you they do. And the patient will say, I'm sorry to waste your time. My daughter wanted me to come today. I understand I have very bad arthritis, I have very bowed legs, but I don't care, you're not going to touch me, thanks for your time. <laughs> so why there's that difference in pain thresholds, we don't really have a good handle on, but my point is it's a spectrum. And so when anything is a spectrum, anybody who's looking at ways to reduce who gets the operation is going to say, well, if, if there are different times when you can operate in the disease cascade, why isn't everybody operating at the same time? And one of the surrogates for that is this regional variation. So. If everybody is the same in the country, essentially, okay, why wouldn't the rates of knee replacement in New York City be the same as they are in San Francisco? And obviously that's an oversimplification, but there's tremendous uh, regional variation in both hip and knee replacement. And this is a study from the Dartmouth Atlas. And basically if you look at Colorado Springs, Sioux Falls, St. Paul, San Francisco, and Honolulu, these are considered 10 of the healthiest cities in the United States. So if you have the healthiest 
people in the United States, you'd think that your rates of hip or knee replacement would be relatively low because uh, to some extent your weight will affect how often you get knee arthritis. So thinner people should have less knee arthritis. And if you look at this map of the United States, and these different shades of blue are different rates of utilization of the procedures. So uh, here you can see St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, it's 12.9 knee replacements per 1,000 Medicare enroll enrollees. Colorado Springs is about the same, okay, and these are all very healthy cities. But if you look a little bit closer, San Francisco pretty low, six, Honolulu even lower, four, okay. So St. Paul, Minnesota supposedly is as healthy as Honolulu is, yet their rate of uh, knee replacements per 1,000 Medicare enrolls ease is almost 300 percent higher. So the government steps back and says, why is that the case? What, what's going on? How are we going to fix this? And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So. Um, the, the modern quality movement in medicine started in about 1999. Some of you may be familiar with this report, but it's uh, titled To Air as Human Building a Safer Health System, and it was put out by the Institute of Medicine. And essentially what the authors claimed was that there were up to 100,000 patients per year who died in U.S. hospitals due to what they deemed preventable medical errors. That's a shockingly high number. It certainly was to a lot of us at that time. And they, you can see the costs here are uh, extensive, 17 to 28 billion. Uh, and they didn't think it was really due to bad Apple providers, but they thought it was problems with systems, processes, and conditions, and really poorly coordinated care. So this set off the modern quality movement. And one of the things that we're charged with now is trying to demonstrate to the payers what our value to the system is. So uh, does anybody know uh, what the Toyota operating system is? Okay, so. Uh, Toyota is obviously a very successful car company. They've been around for almost 100 years. And they have a, a uh, very unique philosophy, and they, t they term it the Toyota operating system. But anyways, the goal of the system is to get out all the waste. So if you get out all the waste in the system and you can be efficient, everybody's going to be happier. You're going to get more bang for your buck. So that's a, a much different thing than healthcare in a lot of ways. And, and critics will say, don't even a try to apply a factory assembly line to what goes on in medicine. Unfortunately, we're at that point where we kind of have to, because we have to learn from them. So uh, one of the things that is integral to the Toyota operating system is their value proposition. So they're trying to uh, capitalize their value and make it uh, as value at valuable as possible. And that's defined as what the benefit is or the quality of the services over the cost. And there are lots of, of people who are, are interested in this. And what the government says is that, okay, we're not just going to say we're not going to pay you anything for the operation, or these people can't have the operations because we can only have X number of patients have the operation per year. They're saying, let's try to make people demonstrate their value. And if you have high value to the system, then we'll go ahead and continue to, uh, to pay for it, essentially. So you can see Congress and hospitals and patients and everybody else have a stake here. But in any field, it must be defined around the customer. So for this, it's the patient and not the suppliers, which are the providers. And provider-centered healthcare has been the norm uh, for as long as anybody can remember. Um, and uh, that's really what needs to change. And we need to get into a, a patient and family-centered care approach, which we're doing here at Stanford. There are other institutions that are way ahead of us and who have sort of pioneered them. One of them is Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I'm from outside of Boston. And I was a uh, famous Boston uh, Globe reporter who was given a fatal dose of the wrong chemotherapy agent uh, in the 1990s. And this started uh, their whole patient and family-centered care movement. And it's really starting to gain hold across the country, and it's great to see. So anyways, we're all trying to show what our value is now so that we can continue to do this. And Zagat does that obviously very well. If you want to see what restaurant you're going to go to tonight, you're going to go read Zagat. Okay, we can do that in healthcare too. And that's where things are headed. So. When we have this discussion with the providers, the question is, how are you going to define quality and really what is quality? And, and that's debatable. But is it having fewer complications? Is it having the best pain relief? Is it having greater patient sat satisfaction? Is it improving life expectancies? Or is it improving functional outcomes? Or is it all of them? And it's probably all of them. Well, how do you, you go about actually improving quality? So there's different ways to tackle it. But uh, you can break it down into structural measures and things that have been implemented so far, the electronic health record. Uh, optimizing nursing ratios, and these things are really easy to define. They're hard to change, especially things like nursing ratios, but once you get them there, they work pretty well. 
but once they're there, they can't really be modified a whole lot. So those are structural quality efforts that could uh, work well. We could look at process measures, and some of the things we look at are, do we give people antibiotics on a regular basis before uh, they have an operation? Or do we give everybody who have a hip or knee replacement a blood thinner afterwards to try to minimize the chance that they'd get a blood clot? And the, the evidence to do those things is very, very strong, yet our ability to do them historically has not been 100%, and you would think it is 100%. If you were gonna get your hip replaced, and you went to have it and you were put to sleep and you weren't given an antibiotic 30 minutes before the surgeon made the skin incision, your chance of having an infection is higher than if you had. And you wouldn't think that that, that would ever, ever go on uh, anywhere in the United States in 2013, uh, but it does. You can look at outcome measures, which are relatively objective. Um, you can do things like look at complication rates and what are people's functional status. That's, that's a good way to, to go about demonstrating your quality. The problem is that all patients are different. So when you're trying to compare what value is for hip and knee replacement here, uh, at places like Stanford or UC San Francisco or other tertiary institutions, it's well known that we treat the patients who are really at the end of their rope. They're the sickest patients, they have some of the difficult problems, they need special expertise to be helped. And uh, because we tend to have patients like that, our outcomes may not uh, look as good on paper in terms of how many people have heart attacks or how many people have strokes compared to somebody who is doing the healthiest people uh, and they're leaving the hospital in two days because they're healthy people. What you bring to the table really defines what your uh, complication rates are gonna be in a lot of ways. So one of the things we're struggling with is how are we gonna demonstrate that our patients have a higher risk around the surgery and it's not just putting them in a category one, two, three, or four, it's actually drilling down and saying that uh, yes, this patient has congestive heart failure, but mild congestive heart failure is a very different animal than severe congestive heart failure. And so you have to risk adjust when you're talking about outcome measures. And we're in the process actually of doing that now and getting some things that would be applicable to everybody, which would be very helpful for us. And then you can look at patient experience measures, which the government is very interested in now. So the hospital gets a report card for their patients. Any of you who have been patients may have <clears throat> been asked to fill out surveys regarding how your experience was. That's very helpful for us. Um, but the hospital gets a report called, called their HCAP score, Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems. Um, and uh, now HCAP scores uh, soon are, are going to uh, be linked to payments. So if you have low patient satisfaction scores or low report card, you're not gonna get uh, reimbursed as much money from the federal government for a certain procedure because your scores aren't as high. So that's already happening and it's gonna happen more. And then you can look at efficiency measures, uh, which really are gonna have a significant impact on cost of care. Unfortunately, these are difficult to measure the true cost of care accurately because they're uh, incredibly sophisticated and complicated, um, and correlation with any quality has uh, yet to be established. But most people will agree that the more efficient the process is, generally the better the outcome is going to be, and generally the lower complication rates are gonna be. So the authors of this paper, which was just recent in 2013, and, and these are multiple thought leaders in uh, the orthopedic field in the quality realm, call for a triple aim. They want to improve the experience of care, improve the population health, and reduce costs. And everybody agrees those are, are, are admirable aims. The question is, how are we going to uh, get there? And we'll look at that in a minute. So if you just take a step back and, and look at outcomes research in general, uh, the, the outcomes movement was started by a gentleman named Ernest Amory Codman. And he worked at a place called Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and uh, he uh, was a surgeon, and he uh, had a radical idea of actually, instead of showing your success of a procedure based on objective measurements by the surgeon, how about we ask the patient how they think the operation went? And the surgeons didn't really like that approach very much, so they kicked him out of the hospital. <coughs> Literally, they kicked him out of the hospital. He went down the street to another hospital. He was a very successful practitioner. Um, so he went on to found the American College of Surgeons, which is still their main governing body today. Uh, and he created a hospital standardization program to look at outcomes. And this has gone on to become JACO, which is the Joint Commission for Accreditation of Hospitals Organizations. So that is uh, the organization that accredits all of our hospitals in the United States. So he was way before his uh, time, and he's credited with uh, the modern, uh, he's considered to be the pioneer of the outcomes uh, movement today. So uh, has anybody heard of Six Sigma or the Sigma scale? All right. so. Uh, Six Sigma was uh, coined in 1984 by engineers, um, and uh, Jack Welch, who was the CEO of General Electric, is really credited with bringing it uh, to the popular vernacular. But um, Sigma is essentially the Greek letter which represents one standard deviation. Um, and uh, for the average U.S. company, uh, 
for every uh, million opportunities that something happens, there are 66,800 defects. So that's how many times uh, things go wrong per million opportunities on average for a U.S. company. So everybody would agree that we probably could be able to do better than that, and how are we going to do that? So that's where the sigma scale comes in. So the goal of, of anything to do with the sigma scale is to reduce the number of defects that a process creates. And this is making it more efficient, and this is what the Toyota operating system is about in part. So let's look at the, six, at the sigma scale. So uh, six sigma right here, okay, is 3.4 errors per million opportunities, okay? Uh, and so that's what everybody would like to get to is six sigma. So very few defects per opportunity. And if you look at these relative uh, values here, so domestic airline fatalities are about six sigma in terms of safety, okay? Uh, one sigma here, which is really not very good, is low back pain treatment, okay? So about a 50% success rate, that's one sigma, all right? Here's IRS tax advice is about two and a half sigma. And here's healthcare organization management, surprise, surprise. Uh, about four sigma, that's pretty good. So you can see everybody would like to get to six sigma, which is 3.4 errors per million opportunities. But the question is, can we attain this in healthcare? So if you look at patients who are uh, admitted to a hospital for a heart attack, okay, there's a drug called the beta blocker, which I'm sure some of you are on, but it's been shown to uh, improve outcomes after a heart attack. The number of patients who get this routinely, okay, is about one sigma despite what the evidence shows, which is, in my understanding, I'm not a cardiologist, but is not very controversial. And then if you look at anesthesia, so an anesthesia had uh, 50 deaths per million in the 1980s, and they've been able to reduce this to five deaths per million opportunities uh, in uh, the 21st century, so that's five to six sigma, so that's pretty good. So how are we doing in terms of hip and knee replacement on the sigma scale? So these are unpublished data. I worked on a project called the Medicare Patient Safety Monitoring System, which was created in 2004, and it was sort of the beginning of the quality movement from the government's perspective so that they could actually figure out what are the complication rates for Medicare enrollees in the hospital. So they had nurse practitioners actually go through the charts uh, and take a look at all hip and knee replacements who were Medicare beneficiaries, and they quantified what the complication rates were. Um, and I, we have gone on to publish this data, and the goal was for the government is to say, Okay, here are the baseline complication rates in 2004. Okay, if you meet these complication rates, you're going to have the same payment as always. If your complication rates are higher, we're not going to pay you as much. And if your complication rates are lower, we're going to pay you a little bit more. So that's what the impetus for the project was. So we went on to just put these into the sigma scale, the complication rates for hip and knee replacement. And I won't bore you with all of these. Okay, but these are all different complications that you could have after a hip or knee replacement. Infection, blood clot, injury to your nerve, hip dislocation, heart attack, have to go back to the operating room, urinary tract infection, pneumonia, bleeding. And I won't go through these, but you can see there are not a lot of sixes and fives here, right? It's two, threes, and fours. So on the sigma scale anyways, for knee replacements, we could do a lot better, and the same uh, can be said for hip replacements. Okay, this, on the sigma scale for hip replacement, and this was in 2004, 2005, and 2006, uh, you can see a lot of twos, threes, and fours, and no fives and no sixes. So there's definitely room for improvement in reducing complication rates after hip and knee replacement uh, as far as, as the 2004 data shows. All right, so if you're going to look at how we can improve things from the payer standpoint, okay, so the major payers, the federal government, they represent about 50% of all patients. And essentially the commercial insurers uh, represent everybody else, but they basically follow the rules of Medicare. And whatever rules Medicare makes, they go ahead and make their own rules that are very similar to Medicare. So Medicare essentially sets the bar for everybody. So from a payer's perspective, how are we going to control costs? Well, you can pay less. Um, and they do that, uh, at least for hip and knee replacement, routinely. So every couple of years, there's a committee called the Resource Utilization Committee that meets. And they send out surveys to surgeons to find out how many of these operations do you do a year and how much uh, do you get paid. And then they determine how much providers are going to get paid based on that survey data. It's as simple as that. And so uh, surgeons, like many other industrious people, uh, if you're going to get paid less to do something and you have the same number of bills, you're going to just go ahead and do more if you can. So that's what surgeons do. So the government says, oh, well, you used to take three hours to do a hip replacement. You can now do it in an hour and a half, so we're going to pay you half as much. So you've, they've kind of shot themselves in the foot. But so from a payer's perspective, you can just flat out pay people less. Well, that's probably not a good uh, situation because eventually you're going to pay the surgeons so little that one, people won't want to go into it. We won't have anybody to train. And other people will say it's not worth 
uh, the risks and the stress that I have to take day in and day out if I can't pay off my loans to the medical school to go ahead and do this. So many people think we're at that point now, and I love what I do, and I'm not here to complain, but I'm just telling you that's sort of what the sentiment is across surgeon. Surgeon satisfaction supposedly is at an all-time low now. Well, the second strategy would be to eliminate fraud, and everybody agrees that that's a good thing. This is really low-hanging fruit, and interestingly enough, uh, what the government has done uh, is that specifically for hip and knee replacement, one of their first cost containment strategies has to uh, hire what they call recovery audit contractors. So these are independent contractors who will go back through the surgeon's notes and uh, years after you've had a hip or knee replacement, they'll look through your notes and if the surgeon didn't say that this patient had three months of physical therapy before they had their joint replacement, they'll say, oh sorry, you did the operation too soon, the money we paid you, we want it back, plus you're gonna pay us interest. So this is going on today. This, I'm not making this up, this has been going on now for about two years. Uh, and it's going on, they, fit, they start with the busiest providers who they see doing the most number of procedures, but this is actually what's going on. Uh, and then perhaps the best strategy for the payers would be to improve value, and that's where we come into play. So there's lots of different ways to show uh, your, what your value is, and these are all different ways, but you have the physician quality reporting system, which is a voluntary reporting system for uh, providers to be involved in demonstrating what the complication rates are. And if you do a good job, you get paid more. If you do a bad job, you don't get paid as much. As you can imagine, if that's a voluntary effort, people are probably not going to be too interested in it. Um, accountable care organizations are getting a lot of buzz now, and this is probably, in my opinion, going to be the most successful way to reduce costs. So that's essentially getting the providers and the hospitals to get together and, and create what they call an accountable care organization. So the payer is going to pay uh, the provider and the hospital X amount, and they're going to say, here's your money, you do the procedure, you take care of the patient for 90 days. Uh, if you can do it for cheaper, that's great. You've saved yourself a lot of money and you all have money. If it costs you more to do that, then you're gonna lose money. But if, if you put everybody on the same table and the, everybody has skin in the game, so to speak, that's probably the best way to reduce costs. And so that's what we're working on now. And then I talked to you about HCAP scores, which is essentially patient satisfaction scores from their hospital experience. And what the government is saying is that if, uh, you, do, uh, if you have good patient satisfaction, you'll get paid more. If you have poor patient satisfaction, you'll get paid less. And then uh, SKIP is the Surgical Care Improvement Project. And uh, it's uh, along the same lines. Essentially, they look at, at common complications for hospitalized patients, urinary tract infections, pneumonias, falls, bed sores, things like that. And there's been a big effort to try to reduce these bad things happening, and it's been successful. So the PPACA, uh, as I said, it's uh, not necessarily healthcare reform, but it's really payment reform, and we won't go into that. Um, one of the problems with just trimming how much you're going to pay providers is, as I said, there's going to be access problems. So this is a very interesting study done by a gentleman named Carlos Laverni, and it, it just came out in 2012. Anyways, he has a busy uh, joint replacement practice in South Florida. And essentially what he did was he had uh, people call the various uh, surgeons in Florida who did hip and knee replacement. And they broke people into whether they had private insurance versus Medicaid insurance. And if you had Medicaid insurance, on average, 14% of the offices would offer uh, the patients a appointment just to see the surgeon. If you had private insurance, you got an appointment all the time. Okay, so, and if you had uh, government health care insurance here, you waited for a much longer time to have the appointment. So this is what the providers are doing, and this does not bode well for access to care. Okay, so here's uh, an a, a recent effort by Medicare to uh, make a quality chart book. And uh, we'll go through a couple of things for a joint replacement they're looking at, but these are now the government payers uh, drilling down to how are we going to figure out who's doing a good job doing joint replacements and who's not doing a good job. And let's figure out a level playing field by which we can actually implement some changes based on what your value to the system is. So uh, they're looking at all these possible complications after a hip or knee replacement. So a heart attack, if you get an infection, if you get pneumonia, if you have a bleeding episode, if you have a blood clot go to your lungs, uh, if you have a problem with the actual prosthesis that was put in, if you have a wound infection, and obviously if you die, that's a pretty objective measure. 
basic stuff, right? So the first question they ask is, are the rates of complications and readmission after elective hip and knee replacement changing over time? Um, and what you can see here, essentially the answer to that is no, okay? So this is uh, risk stratified uh, data. So they actually risk stratify the patient. So if you have no medical problems, you get score, uh, say, one, okay? And if you have congestive heart failure and high blood pressure and diabetes and kidney problems, maybe you get a score of six. With the idea being the higher your score is, the greater the likelihood is that you'd have a problem after the operation. So essentially what they found is that the, the rates of the operations uh, are not really, or the rates of the complications are not really changing uh, at all over the entire area of the country. However, do the rates of complications and readmission after elective hip replacement vary across the hospitals? And like anything, there are people who are good at what they do, and there are people who aren't so good at what they do. And hospitals and surgeons are no different. So what they found here <clears throat> is a, a wide variation in, in terms of uh, rates of uh, complications and readmissions. Okay, so readmission is kind of a surrogate for the care that you get. So if you have an operation and you're in, back in the hospital within 30 days for a certain reason, uh, the payers will say, well, maybe there was a problem with the procedure and you guys could have done something better. So uh, the government doesn't like this and they want to reduce this and they want to figure out how they can bring everybody up to a level playing field to make the operation safer for everybody. And then do the complication rates after hip and knee replacement vary across different regions of the United States? And you can see here in the Pacific Northwest, these are the complication rates. It's a little small, but 4.8% and 1.2% was the worst. And of course they're different, uh, but not really that much different and that's what the government found uh, as very interesting. However, do the readmission rates uh, vary? And the answer to that is no as well. So that's good too. So the government wants to cut down on this variation of the success of the procedure. And so they're going to make us demonstrate what the value is. So that's what the people who pay for the services are doing. So now let's look at what you guys can do as patients. And my message to you is you need to get engaged. Okay. Um, there's a, a whole literature out there that shows that the more engaged people are in their health, uh, the better uh, off they are going to be from a health perspective, the happier they're going to be, uh, and so on and so on. So we need people to get engaged. So this study was, does patient activation matter? And that's engaging you in your, your health care by whatever way it could be, whether it's having access to an electronic health record so you can see actually what your lab values are or actually following up with all your appointments and doing things like that. But it's very obvious and, and should come as no surprise that if you are engaged in your health care, uh, you're going to be a healthier person and probably a happier person. And that's an oversimplification, but that's essentially what the literature shows. So we need you guys to be engaged in this. So does anybody know what health grades is? So there are now many uh, essentially consumer rating agencies that are rating uh, hospitals and providers on the quality of their care. Okay? Uh, the first time this happened really was to the cardiac surgeons in the state of Pennsylvania where they essentially wrote, uh, made it public what everybody's complication rates were. They do that now for hip and knee replacement patients in uh, Pennsylvania as well. And essentially that's what Health Grades does. So Health Grades was one of the original companies that essentially uses what we call Medicare claims data. So that the, the way that uh, hospital gets paid for a patient from, who has Medicare insurance come into the hospital, they send them a bill and the bill essentially has a bunch of codes on it. And if you had complications that required more resources while you were hospitalized, you're going to get paid more. Um, and so uh, that is what we call administrative claims data. And in that claims data is rates of complications. So that's public knowledge. And anybody can get their hands on it if they want to. So Health Grades takes that claims data and, and translates it into one, three, or five stars for various services. So this website uh, uh, gets one million hits uh, per day in the United States. So it's also the most popular. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the methodology so you can understand uh, why we're even talking about this. But let's just say it's controversial at best. So uh, here were our quality ratings for hip replacement and knee replacement in 2013, 12, 11, and 10. So each year, you can get one, three, or five stars. Okay, And three stars is average. Five stars is the best. One star is uh, not so good. And for hip and knee replacement here, you can see we were very low, as well as for hip fracture uh, treatment. So our question was why. So for each year, so for 2010, the score is reflective of the previous three years. So the rates of complications for 2007, 2008, and 2009 for patients at Stanford Hospital who had Medicare insurance comes out as the 2010 score. So there's a, it's a th what we call a three-year rolling average. So we didn't understand why this was the case. Um, and we've drilled down quite a bit. We've actually engaged health grades to help us. Um, and we, we've spent a fair amount of money on this project. And the good news is, is that 
we don't necessarily agree with what their methodology is, and the main reason is that they don't have a good way to risk stratify uh, who's going to have a problem and who's going to not have a problem. And so in a way, all of their data is flawed. However, that being said, we think it's important. And by engaging them, we've actually been able to change systems. And as many of you probably know, sometimes if you work at an institution for a long time, the institution is set in their ways, and you need outside people to come in to actually tell you what you already know, but you need them to tell you how to do it. So Stanford's no different. So they have actually provided us with that, and you're going to see uh, that we've been uh, reaping some of those uh, fruits of our labor. So here's knee replacement, here's hip replacement, here's hip fracture care, okay? And this is uh, all payer complications risk adjusted for in the hospital. Um, and you can see the green is where you want to be. So this is uh, total knee replacement. 5% of the patients have a complication, okay? Uh, Stanford rate was 12%, and uh, the average was 3%. So room for improvement, how about hip replacement? Room for improvement as well. The best hospitals had only 5% of their patients had complications, Stanford 14%. Uh, and hip fracture, same story. So no question we could do better based on what uh, their methodology was. So one of the things that we did at Stanford is that we, uh, as I said, I think we have very uh, sick patients who have very challenging problems, uh, but we have engaged uh, internal medicine doctors to help us with all patients uh, who are hospitalized and essentially uh, manage all of the complicated medical issues that we uh, have to face. From a resource perspective, the surgeons have to operate. We have to teach residents how to operate. And we didn't have the resources necessary to uh, take the best care of the patients that we could. And that wasn't unique to Stanford. It was uh, universal. But uh, the good news here is you can see our complication rates since we have engaged this group of internists to help us manage our patients, which in part was precipitated by the Health Grades Project. Uh, these rates have gone uh, way down. So this is number of major complications after knee replacement. Um, and right here is the three-star average, OK? And here's where Stanford started, right here, OK? And now we're down almost to five stars. So that'll take a couple years uh, to, to actually come to fruition for our score. But this is as of January of 2012. So it's even better now. I won't show you the last four quarters. But the, the bottom line is we're back now close to five stars. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the methodology. So um, there is what they call an observed to expected ratio. So you have the actual number of complications, and then you have an expected number of complications based on what the patient's profile is. And part of the problem is that people have to cook the books, so to speak. So if we have somebody who comes in who has a very bad heart from having multiple heart attacks, and we don't put that in the chart anywhere, and health grades can't see that, and the patient has a heart attack after the operation, that doesn't go on as being something that was present on admission and would be expected. However, if it was documented appropriately and health grades saw that it was, then that heart attack, we would consider that to be expected. Okay, so in large part, we think we are giving better care, but a lot of it, quite frankly, has to do with cooking the books and doing a better job of documenting what the problems are. But, so uh, this is risk-adjusted major complications. Again, this red line is where we'd like to get to, which is five stars, and we're getting closer. So we're making progress. Uh, these are just the different complication rates uh, or actual complications. I won't uh, show you uh, what they are, but out of 600 patients, uh, 37 patients had complications. So um, it's not an alarmingly high number. The same is uh, true essentially for hip replacement. Again, you can see this uh, area down here is where would you like to be for number of complications. This is five star. And back in 2010, we're up here at one star, and now we're down to five stars. We're back up a little bit, but we're back down now. This is. Uh, June of 2012, and now we're down into five-star uh, territory. So we're very happy and very proud of that. There's a lot of hard work that's gone into this project, um, but this is one of the things that we can do, and that's essentially the same data here. And this is uh, showing you exactly what the actual complications were at. So out of uh, six months, 520 hip replacement patients, 27 patients had complications for a total of 41 complications. And I won't go through the specific ones. These will bore you guys. But these are essentially opportunities that the company has shown. Here's a case. Let's go ahead and see why this patient had uh, problems with their kidneys after the operation and what could have been done better to optimize their results. So it's a learning process for everybody. But the optimization process is essentially identifying the patient at risk, modifying their care to account for that. And hopefully that will translate to improved outcomes. And that's what uh, we are seeing. Here's uh, the pie chart looking at how you can actually optimize orthopedic surgery quality elements. Uh, the preoperative evaluation is key. We've actually just implemented a multidisciplinary preoperative clinic that's going to happen in our, at our offices in Redwood City now, where uh, instead of having to go to our clinic 
and seeing uh, the nurse practitioner to do your new history and physical exam and then coming to the hospital uh, to see the anesthesiologist and then maybe having to go talk to your internist afterwards or going to get a CAT scan uh, to see how your carotid arteries are. All that's going to be done in one morning at Redwood City. So the patients will see our nurse practitioner. They will see uh, a uh, nurse practitioner from our service, a nurse practitioner from anesthesia, and then an actual internal medicine doctor all at the same. And we think by having that rigorous screening process, we'll be able to do a better job of optimizing patients before the operation. Uh, so the story for hip fracture is essentially the same as it is for hip and knee replacements. Um, it's a well-known fact that the sooner you get your hip replacement fixed uh, after it happens, the better off you do. And many hip fracture patients have many medical problems and they need to have various stress tests and EKGs and consults from nephrologists and kidney doctors and lung doctors and everything else. So we didn't do a very good job of getting patients to the operating room as expeditiously as we could. And you know that's not an oversight, it, it's an effort, maybe it's too much care. So there can be too much care and there can be not enough care and there can be just enough care. And everybody's trying to get to just enough care. So we're, we're starting to get there uh, for hip fractures, but you can still, we see we still have uh, a ways to go. So just so you know, all this data is publicly available. You can go to the Health Grades website um, and also to uh, Medicare databases to see it. So this is all out there, but the, the good news is, is that we're moving in the right direction. And uh, essentially what, I won't go through all this, but what's going to happen when a patient has a hip fracture in our emergency department is that they'll be sort of swooped upon by the orthopedic surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the internal medicine doctor, and the patients will get to the operating room sooner than that, and there's a lot of data to show that that actually, when that kind of system is implemented, it works well, so that's what we're getting towards. All right, so now let's look on what the doctors can do to improve quality. So we can define quality, which we've talked a little bit about, and uh, I think we have a long ways to go, but at least we have people engaged in the process now, which I don't think we have in the past. We have to be honest about our opportunities for improvement. We need to demonstrate our quality, advocate for tort reform. Uh, there's no question that so-called defensive medicine is a big co contributor to uh, higher medical costs. It's not as big of a problem here in California as it is in other places, but um, working harder is probably not going to be the answer, and uh, I don't think you'll get many surgeons arguing with you on that. So here are some of the quality efforts that we're working on for uh, hip replacement and knee replacement. Uh, there is something called the American Joint Replacement Registry. And the idea here is that uh, if you have a hip or knee replacement, because there's so many of them done, the information on some level should go into a central repository. Uh, so if you have an implant that is failing early, the more patients you have put into that registry, so to speak, the quicker you'll be able to find that there's a problem with the prosthesis. So we had cases here in California in 1999 and I'll give you an example. So there was a, a company that manufactured a hip socket in Texas, and they changed the manufacturing process ever so slightly, and it was part of the sterilization process that they changed. It was a very honest thing that they did to change it, and it left a greasy residue on the back of the socket. So they went, the socket is a porous material where the bone grows into it when it's put in, into your pelvis. Imagine if you have a three-dimensional structure that the bone's trying to grow into and there's some grease on the back of it. You can't see it. Surgeon puts it in, there's grease on the back, the bone doesn't grow into it. Okay, here in California, you had surgeons putting in that implant. A year later, it wasn't working, and the, the patient had a revision with that exact same implant. Okay, that was 1999 here in California, not very long ago. So if you have a register, okay, that kind of stuff won't happen because more people will know about it earlier. So that's the whole idea behind a register. Uh, there have been very successful registries from Scandinavia, primarily the Swedish hip replacement registry is the most successful one. Uh, there is now one uh, called the National Joint Replacement uh, Registry of England and Wales that's about 10 years old, and there's also a, a very productive registry in Australia. So those are smaller countries. They have relatively homogenous populations compared to the United States. There have been lots of barriers to getting a joint replacement registry going here in the United States. Uh, I won't go into them, but anyways, it's going now. Okay, we are we are one of the 20 pilot sites, and uh, I don't know what the exact numbers are now, but there's probably something over 100 hospitals that are, are contributing data. Okay, in Sweden, there I think in Sweden I know the gentleman well who started their registry. His name is Henrik Malkow. He's one of my mentors. I think there are 58 hospitals in Sweden, and he created this registry in large part. He went to every hospital and met with the hospital administrators and the surgeons to get everybody on board with the effort. In the United States, I think there's 5,800 hospitals. 
Okay? So you can imagine ha how much of a bigger effort it is to get something like this going in the United States. But anyways, it's going. And our chairman here, uh, Bill Maloney, has been one of the pioneers of this effort. So this is a major quality initiative, and there's no question that it's going to uh, be an excellent thing. Uh, funding for this is hard to come by. We have done pretty well so far for, for securing funding in the short term, but it's by no means a done, done deal. So we're getting there. So that's the American Joint Replacement Registry, and we contribute our cases go to the American Joint Replacement Registry from here at Stanford. And we also have the California Joint Replacement Registry. Um, we were the fourth hospital uh, into this registry, and we now have about 20 uh, hospitals in the state that are putting their data in. And this is actually a much more comprehensive registry uh, than the American Joint Replacement Registry. So the more people there are, uh, the less data about each person you can have to keep it feasible. But in California, even though there's 35 million people here, um, we're quite ambitious about this project. And the main thing that we think that is going to uh, separate this California Joint Replacement Registry from others is that we have patient reported outcomes. So that's taking, we have level one data, which is essentially, are you a male or a female? How old are you? Where do you live? What kind of insurance do you have? There's level two data which says uh, what uh, kind of operation did you have? What were the implants did you have? And then we have level three data, we call it. And every time you go up a level, there's more information that's harder to get. And patient reported outcomes are the next level. So actually having the patients fill out surveys saying that I like my knee replacement, I like my hip replacement, I don't like it. How satisfied am I on a scale of one to 10, things like that. So this is going to be a very powerful tool for consumers to pick out who's doing a good job with hip replacement and where do I want to go and have my hip replacement done. So we're still in the early stages of it. It's about three years going, and we have funding for two more years, but we're still looking for a permanent home from a funding perspective. So as of November 14, 2012, and we had about 3,000 cases in the registry um, and uh, more submitted but uh, had not been operated on. And so we can look at what medical problems do the patients have who are getting operated on, obesity, diabetes, coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure. You can see that. So it's a very powerful tool. And payers would love to have this because then they can direct the people whose health care they're paying for, specifically this operation, to the providers that do the best job and, and provide the best value. And that's where we're going with this. We want to be able to show what value are. So here's PROs, or patient reported outcomes. And getting patients to actually fill out these forms is difficult to do. I, I don't blame patients, OK? They are uh, not terribly lengthy, but it's just one thing else you have to think about. Um, and it's very important that we get a preoperative patient reported outcome because if we don't get that data point, we don't know where you started from. And in general, if you don't start off from having much disability, you're not going to have that much improvement. So looking at any relative comparison to how much better you get or how worse you get is really important. So uh, you can see here for all of the hospitals, these are three different outcome measures. Okay, preoperative, so before the operation, how many patients actually f we could get to fill out these forms, it's about 50%. So that's not very good. So we're struggling with this. It's even worse after the operation, one year. 10% of patients would fill it out. We are kind of our own worst enemies for hip and knee replacement because the operations work well. And if the operation works well and your hip doesn't hurt and you forget you have a hip replacement, you don't want to come to the doctor. You certainly don't want to pay any money to go to the doctor to have something looked at that doesn't hurt you. So that's part of the problem. But we're, we're working on ways to improve collection rates of patient reported outcomes. Um, I won't go into any of this. The uh, effort was, uh, has been funded by the California Healthcare Foundation, which is essentially a large nonprofit which invests $40 million annually. Um, we've been very lucky to, to have them fund us, but as I said, we're looking for a permanent uh, funder at this point. And so one of uh, the California Healthcare Foundation's tenets is that they want to have uh, what they call publicly reported outcomes. So they want the consumer to be able to see, especially for preference sensitive care, who's doing a good job and who's doing a bad job. And so the question is, well, why does anybody want to do that? Does that really work? So the answer is yes, it does work. And so if you look here um, at two uh, different examples, so this is going to be obstetric care and cardiac care. And this is average number of quality improvement activities in OBGYN and cardiac care okay, among hospitals who weren't doing so well in uh, under three uh, study conditions. So this is when uh, your outcomes are publicly reported, when they're privately reported to the hospital, so the hospital tracks you, but they're not actually releasing it to the public, and with no reporting. And you can see, here's the number of activities. As soon as the data on how good of a job you do with the patient is going to the public, quality improvement efforts come out, no surprise. 
All right, and then let's look at the provider impact. So here's percentage of hospitals with statistically significant improvements or declines in their outcomes once they get publicly reported. And you can see if you publicly report things, many more uh, uh, examples of significant improvements are gonna occur compared to if you don't publicly report. So having the public or the, con the consumers know how good a job people are doing definitely changes provider uh, behavior. It's very, very strong and that's a great thing. So uh, we're trying to be involved in it. You know, we don't want the rules to be set without us as providers being involved in trying to demonstrate what's important and we're uh, actively involved in that discussion now. So this was a follow-up to the Institute of Medicine's original report. Uh, this is now Cross and Equality uh, Chasm in 2001, uh, and uh, it's a new healthcare system for the 21st century. And this, these are 10 things that the Institute of Medicine thought should be done uh, to, to cross that chasm, so to speak. And if you look at the uh, four that I have circled here, care is customized according to patients' needs and values, the patient is the source of control, knowledge is shared and information flows freely, and things need to be transparent. All these are tenets of what we call patient and family-centered care. So this is a paradigm shift from physician-driven or disease-centered care to really provider non-centered care and patient and family-centered care, where the patient and the family are the boss and they make the decisions uh, with the providers, of course, but they're the ones who are running the show. So that's where we're going towards this. So there are many components of patient-centered care, and a lot of them are very basic. Cultural competence, coordination of care, actually having the doctors talk to each other, that's remarkable health literacy, increasing patient safety, but one of them is shared decision making. And this is something that I've been interested in. And shared decision making uh, is now something that, that Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Aetna in the state of California two years ago started to look at when they developed what they call their uh, preferred provider networks. So if you were a provider who had some sort of shared decision making program in place, then you would go on that list. You could do everything else great, but if you didn't do so-called shared decision making, then you wouldn't uh, be able to get on that list. So it's uh, becoming more and more important. And essentially what it is is engaging the patients in the discussion about if you have a hip or knee replacement, uh, in the first 90 days, there is a uh, one half percent of a chance. So uh, for one half a percent for hips and a little bit less for knees that you will die if you have the operation. So I can guarantee you that if you go into many surgeons' offices and you ask them, what's going to happen to me and what bad can happen, they're not going to tell you that you have a half a percent chance of dying in the first 90 days. And, and I don't blame them, okay? But the goal of the shared decision making is to have transparency and make sure everybody knows what the facts are. Happiness in a lot of ways is when reality meets expectations, right? So that's what we're trying to get to with this shared decision making. So this patient and family-centered care approach has been studied. Uh, it's been instituted, as I talked about earlier, by uh, multiple institutions. The Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston is uh, one of the uh, pioneers of this movement. But there are many benefits, and this is stuff put out by the IHI, or the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. But uh, you have reduced length of stay. Costs are less. There's a decrease in complications. The employees are happier, and they'll stay. There's reduced costs for the operating room, decreased malpractice claims, and increased market share. So it definitely works, and everybody wins. The hospital wins, the patient wins, and the providers win. And this is a dramatic example. This is the Medical College of Georgia, and they implemented a patient and family-centered care approach in 2003. And you can see here, so this is uh, number of litigation claims and files, okay, and as soon as they instituted this approach, you can see this exponential drop off in legal action with their patients, okay, so it, it works in a lot of ways, but there's uh, no question it's a good thing, and it's a journey, all right, I, I've been to, there's uh, uh, an institute for patient and family centered care that puts on national conferences, and I've been to it, it was an eye-opening experience, I went about three or four years ago, and I went with a group from Stanford Hospital, um, but they, everybody said, it's a, this is not a change that can happen overnight. You can't implement this type of program in a year or two. It, it's a journey and it's a 10-year program. So Stanford Hospital is in the middle of that journey and we're making good progress, but there is room for improvement. So shared decision making, we talked about a little bit, okay. In essence, it's essentially engaging the patient in an honest discussion as to what can you actually expect about uh, the operation. You can imagine if you get paid to operate on people, you have a conflict that can't necessarily be resolved. And part of shared decision making is trying to resolve that conflict so everybody knows exactly what they're going to get from the operation. Um, I probably won't go through this, but this essentially just shows that for hip and knee replacement surgeons, in general, are not doing a great job of uh, shared decision making to start with, at least as of 2010 when this uh, study was published. So this is. Um, 
uh, expressions of providers and opinions and requests for patient preferences. So for hip and knee replacement compared to other procedures, patients said that about 80% uh, of uh, hip of their providers for hip and knee replacement actually uh, ask for expression of uh, the patient's opinions. And then here, and this is where there's really room for improvement. So this is patients reporting discussions of pros and cons of the operation. This is my favorite. So here's hip and knee replacement. You can see uh, only about half the patients said that their provider actually discussed with them what the pros and cons of the procedure were. That's shocking. But anyways, I, I show you that slide and that study just to show that there's room for improvement. So uh, with a, a patient and family-centered care approach or shared decision-making, you can look at the effectiveness of the exchange of information, the quality of the decision, um, and also the feasibility. And, and uh, doing this approach takes some time. And uh, a surgeon who's busy isn't necessarily going to want to spend a lot of time with you. They want to get on to the next patient. And this, the perception anyways from the surgeon is that it slows people down, and that's not the case. I'm going to show you why. So we just finished a randomized controlled trial that has uh, been published in our lead journal where a surgeon at UC San Francisco and myself with our teams did a formal shared decision-making uh, process with the patients. And essentially what it is is that the patient uh, gets a uh, list of materials that educates them about the procedure before they come for the consultation, and then they engage with a health coach who talk to them after they have had some time to digest that information and they help the patients create a list of questions and those are the questions that are most important to the patient and want to get addressed at the visit. So um, I have patients who have horrible hip arthritis who are young males uh, who really would benefit from the operation uh, who refuse to have the operation because they don't want to have a Foley catheter put in. Okay, I won't go into why but they're the greatest candidates but they don't want to do that. So if I have 15 minutes to spend to, with a patient, and I see, so with what we did, uh, after that list of questions is generated, it gets put on the ghost chart. So when I go to see the patient, I know exactly what's important to the patient. I can talk to you for hours about the operation, just like we're doing tonight, right? Uh, but if I'm talking to you about things that aren't important to you, that's not doing anybody any good. So if the patient is absolutely terrified about having a Foley catheter, I see that question on his face sheet, and we can spend the whole 15 minutes talking about that. And that's what the patient wants. The patient's going to be satisfied. I'm going to be satisfied because the patient's happy. And then maybe the patient will, will have the operation. So that's what we're getting at. And, and the bottom line is the final results from our study is that everybody won. The patients were much happier. The providers were much happier. The office visits were, were, act, office visits were actually more efficient, so they took less time. The government is interested in this approach because they think shared decision making will reduce utilization of a service. And that's been shown in other things like breast cancer treatment, um, and so for hip and knee replacement, they think if you implement this type of procedure, we'll have less procedures, we'll save money. Uh, the results of our study show despite everybody being happier, actually there was no reduction in utilization of the services. So we view that as a win for everybody. The government doesn't like that very much, but can't make everybody happy. All right, good. So lastly, I'm going to talk about what is the hospital doing to try to improve their value and make it a better and safer experience for everybody. So the hospital wants to reduce uh, costs, and one of the ways they think they can do this is to, prov is to hold providers accountable. Like uh, many employers, uh, when there are increased costs to the business, they're going to pass those costs on to their customers, and we're viewed as their customers. So we talked a little bit about it, but here's uh, this new paradigm for academic medical centers. Okay, academic medical centers don't just have clinical practice. They also have research endeavors, and they also have education endeavors. This is very complicated how all this can uh, intermingle, but there is a, a different paradigm. And so one of the things that the hospital looks at is, and this is all publicly available information. You can actually see it in our clinic. So hand hygiene. Most people would like to think that their doctor has either washed their hands or used gel on their hands before they come to see them, right? You would think as a provider, most of us have, at least the surgeons have, some degree of obsessive compulsive disorder, and I probably wash my hands 100 times a day. That's not necessarily a good thing, and there's all kinds of bad things associated with that, but you would think that providers at least would be able to wash their hands or use gel before they see you every time, right? It's a pretty basic thing. There are gel dispensers when you go in the door of the hospital. And I'm the medical director for the orthopedic unit, and this is one of the things we're charged with. But here are the success rates of the hospital being able to get the providers uh, to do this. And we have uh, patient councils where we actually have patients involved in qu various quality efforts. And all the patients have the same reaction. Here are 93%, 94%. This is different areas of the hospital in different uh, years, but it's not 100%. So the, the patients say, how can it not be 100%? And, and I agree with them, how can it not be 100%? But it's not. 
it's okay, it's good, okay, and we have a threshold that we try to achieve of 92% of people going in the room, and this isn't just providers, okay, it's the food uh, workers, it's the chaplain, uh, it's the housekeeping staff, so there's a lot of other people who are being evaluated, but it's not 100%, so the hospital is actively looking at this, and this is just an example of one of the quality programs that they're implementing, and it's not 100%. One of the uh, most interesting things that I learned at the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care conference was this concept of uh, nurses delivering report at the bedside. So the traditional model is that a nurse uh, has six or eight patients, at least on regular ward, um, and at change of shift, which happens at 7 p.m., 3 p.m., and 11 p.m., uh, they give a report to the nurse who's coming on to take care of their six patients. Pretty basic, right? They have traditionally done that in the back room and providers have done the same thing. We make rounds on patients and we do what we call card flips where we talk about the patient we go over the salient facts. And a lot of patients don't understand how much detail and how much time that takes. Uh, so the paradigm shift is actually to do that report in front of the patients. And at this conference and talking to people what they said of all the things that you could do to implement this patient and family centered care, the most important thing in terms of the bang for your buck is to actually do the bedside report or do rounds in front of the patient. Let the patient know how much you're thinking about them, let them know the level of detail that you're thinking about them, and everybody is going to be happier with that. So we have started that program uh, at uh, Stanford with our nurses and we've seen our patient satisfaction scores go up uh, quite a bit. We're very, very happy with that. But that's not rocket science, but uh, getting people actually to change their behavior and do that, it requires a different skill to be able to do that in front of patients. And uh, people are learning and the nurses are very, very ha happy with it. But the impetus was that we had room for improvement in our patient satisfaction scores, at least with orthopedics and nursing. And we've uh, uh, made great strides implementing this nurse bedside report. We do the same thing for doctors, but essentially the idea is that the uh, exchange of information comes uh, from uh, the bedside and not in the back room. We have uh, one of our CEO's uh, uh, initiatives called CI Care uh, that all uh, people in the hospital are supposed to implement when they take care of uh, patients and have any interaction. And CI Care is an acronym that stands for Connect, Introduce, Communicate, Ask, and Respond, and Exit. And essentially this just gives uh, people who are interacting with patients who might not have the most formal experience and even patients who have a lot, people who have a lot of experience with patients, really a framework to use to uh, have a uh, efficient interaction where everybody is happy with us. And we're all working on our CI, scare, CI care skills and it's uh, really been uh, very successful and I think people are very happy with it. HCAP scores, we uh, uh, talked about, this is the hospital's report card and uh, we have room for improvement but we are getting better. And then call light response data, I won't go into the details, but that's the time that it takes from when you ring uh, your call light to talk to somebody if you need something, say a bedpan or something to eat, when that response is, and we could do much better on that. You can see uh, just looking at one week's worth of calls uh, for the orthopedic unit, 1,700 calls, the response time ranged from zero minutes to 20 minutes. So you can imagine if you're that patient. This isn't unique to Stanford, but there's room for improvement there. And if you take people from the Toyota operating system and you bring them in uh, to the a United States hospital environment, they don't know what to do. Uh, they, a guy who um, works in Seattle at Virginia Mason, uh, who really used the Toyota operating system in their hospital and created a tremendous sea of change. I saw a lecture that he gave and they sent a bunch of their executives over to Toyota uh, to uh, work uh, with the senseis, they call them, who are essentially the masters. But they brought the senseis back to Virginia Mason and they had them come to a clinic. And the senseis only speak Japanese. So there's an interpreter. But the first thing the sensei said when he came to the clinic at Virginia Mason is that there were people waiting in the waiting room. And the guy tells the story that there's a five minute exchange between the sensei and the interpreter. And then the interpreter says to the doctor, he says, what are these people doing? <laughs> and he says, well, they're waiting for their appointment. And the sensei could not understand how a patient could have an appointment scheduled for 10:15, and they actually had to sit and wait for something. That concept was foreign. So you can imagine if we could get our system to work that efficiently, how much happier everybody would be. But the call light data is a perfect example of this. There's lots of room for improvement. And then the hospital keeps all kinds of tabs on us as providers, uh, which I think is a great thing. Um, we all do things differently. Uh, 
uh, and uh, there's lots of room to sort of standardize care to both improve outcomes but reduce costs. And I won't go through this, but it essentially it shows that the readmission rate varies, the mortality rate varies. Um, and the question is why and can we do a, a, a better job of it? And the hospital is very active in looking at ways to do a better job, reduce complications, and uh, with that will come reduced uh, uh, costs and uh, uh, hopefully more uh, value in the system. So I won't go through these, but this essentially shows this is a number of tests uh, that are ordered by various providers. And you can see it's EKG, ultrasound, and x-ray, and these all should be the same rates, but they're not. And uh, this is one that's near and dear to me. So this is different surgeons uh, who do a hip replacement at Stanford Hospital. And here are the costs uh, per the case as far as the hospital is concerned. So this is $15,000, okay, but you can see this is a hip replacement. It's a fairly standardized thing. You think all the costs for most patients would be pretty similar per provider, and it's not. So the hospital administrators say, well, what's going on here? Why is that the case? So we're actively working on this now to try to standardize things uh, to uh, uh, save some money there and hopefully provide better outcomes. So that's about all I have for you. This is just a snapshot, and you can see these when you go into our clinics, but essentially these are what we call our press gainy scores, and these are levels of patient satisfaction. Um, and one of the things we look at, and we get compared to our sister institutions, um, but uh, we all want to be in the green. So this is number of patients who would say, yes, we are likely to recommend this provider or this hospital for this various service. And uh, we always have room for improvement. In orthopedics, the last uh, few quarters, we have been in the green, but we're not always. So these are direct patient satisfaction scores. So this is the patient's reporting, and the hospital is paying attention to this because we're going to have our reimbursement in part tied to this. So um, if you've ever bought in a car recently, uh, I haven't, but what I'm told is that one of the last things the salesman will tell you is when you get the survey as to how I did, please give me a five out of five. Don't give me a four out of five. Four <laughs> out of five doesn't help me, okay? So for this, five out of five helps us. It's the same thing, four out of five doesn't. So this is another way uh, by which payers are trying to control costs, but again, it's important because it's improving the patient experience. So. That's about it. So in summary, I'll say the system is changing. It's changing rapidly. Hopefully, we're going to be able to change it for the better. But we need you guys as patients to uh, uh, get engaged and to stay engaged. And the, certainly, that holds true for providers. We have a lot, long way to go for providers being engaged. But I think we have a critical mass now. And hopefully, we'll be able to, uh, to improve things and turn the ship around, so to speak. So thanks very much for your attention. Yeah, so the, did everybody hear the question, is, is 65 a cutoff age? Are they going to start to ration the care uh, for hip and knee replacements? And that's a million dollar question. I don't think anybody knows the answer to it. Uh, there are certain people who will say, okay, if your risk profile to have the operation is too high, you're going to create too much cost for the system, you should go take your pain medicine and sit in your wheelchair and that's going to be it. <coughs> so. When that happens, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen, okay? I can tell you that we as providers only have so much leverage, okay? So the patient, you guys have to revolt, okay? But there are people who are actively lobbying for that approach. So is it going to happen? I don't know. When would it happen? I don't know. Is it 65? I don't know that there will be a discrepancy between Medicare and private insurance, Okay, but there are people who are trying to get that involved. And the patients, you guys, you have the power. Yeah, so there's a lot of thought about that. So the question is, is there any question about uh, ions in the blood uh, from a hip replacement? So um, that is a, a very hot topic, and uh, I'll give you sort of the short story. So when we do a hip replacement, there are three bearing surfaces, and this is kind of like the tire on the road, okay? So there's a metal ball on a plastic liner, okay? There may be a ceramic ball, okay, like a hard mustard jar on a plastic liner. There can be ceramic on a ceramic liner, okay? Or there can be metal on metal. And uh, the reason that this is even a discussion is because uh, in about 1990, when hip replacements were taking off for being very successful, younger people wanted them, and age is in some ways a surrogate for activity. So younger people, more active, they wore their hip replacements out earlier. And when they wore them out with the original bearing surface, which was a plastic, okay, the bone around the prosthesis would get eaten away, and people would have big, huge holes in their pelvis and in their thigh bone. And that makes for a very difficult problem to fix. So there was a lot of research that went into sort of finding, instead of the 50,000-mile uh, tire, the 500,000-mile tire. 
and metal on metal has been put forth as one of those solutions. So, so ceramic bearings and metal on metal bearings <coughs> wear less in a hip simulator compared to a plastic on a metal bearing. The newer plastics probably wear out, I, th I shouldn't say probably, they definitely wear out much less than the last generation of plastics. And the question is, is the current plastics going to be under a threshold where it doesn't wear out? We don't know the answer to that yet, but it's, uh, the clock has been set back with plastic at least 10 years. So with the newest plastic at 10 years, we can't measure any real wearing out. So that bodes well. So the question is, what's the utility of the metal? So the problem with the metal, okay, in a hip simulator, it works great. It wears much less than the plastic. Um, and ceramic does too, but there are some costs associated with that. So instead of getting little plastic particles generated, which you have with metal on plastic, you have metal ions. So it's little metal particles. Those little metal particles cause big problems in some patients, some not so many. So uh, we're seeing what we call adverse local tissue reactions, which are essentially the tissues around the hip melting away as a result of these metal particles. So. Um, there is a uh, well-known implant manufacturer and company called Depew, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, which has had a major recall of their, their most successful metal hip replacement. Okay? And I just read yesterday that Johnson & Johnson uh, has um, withdrawn all metal on metal hip replacements from their entire company. Okay, so um, I don't want to misquote the numbers, but in 2006 or 2007, half of all hip replacements in the United States were metal on plastic. Okay, about 35% uh, were metal on metal, and about 15% uh, were ceramic. Okay, so 35%, that's a lot. Okay, it's now down to less than 5% because of the problems that we're seeing. So, um, the question of do you put a metal on metal bearing on someone is a long discussion. Uh, there are certain people, yes, and certain people who will say no. Um, the, the major, for me, the crux of the argument comes down to to be able to get the benefits of the low wear articulation, okay, you have to put the implant in a very precise position. You can do that in a hip simulator, okay. You can't do that all of the time in a patient because we don't have the technology to do that. So even though if you put the implant in the perfect position, it's going to function well and you shouldn't have a problem, okay? As providers, we can't do that. And if it's a little bit off, it's not very tolerant and you have big problems, okay? All, anybody who has a, a hip or a knee replacement, we recommend that they get followed regularly every year or two. Uh, anybody with a metal on metal hip replacement, you need to be followed at least every year and potentially more often uh, from your surgeon. Yeah. yeah, so the question is, are there any issues like that with wear related to knee replacements? And the answer is yes and no. So if you looked uh, at a paper from 2001 when a busy center went back and looked at why they were doing redo knees, about half of all those uh, problems were due to problems from the actual bearing surface wearing out, like the tire on the car wearing out. Okay, we've recently reported our results here at Stanford, and it used to be about 50% in 2001 wear-related problems. Now it's down to less than 10%. And in 2000, pardon me? Yeah, so uh, probably the biggest change is the environment that the plastic was sterilized in. So it's sterilized in what we call an inert environment where it's not exposed to oxygen. And if it's not exposed to oxygen, it probably is going to last longer. So that's the biggest change. But uh, in 2001, they looked at early failures less than two years after the operation and late failures. The late failures predominantly were due to wear, OK? When we look at our data now, OK, the time of the revision doesn't matter in terms of the effect of wear. The wear rates, wear related failures were the same if we stratified the patients as early failures or late failures. So the biggest problems now that we're seeing with knee replacements are technical issues, okay? Infection is the number one cause. Uh, and then what we call instability where your knee is a little bit sloppy and doesn't feel stable and stiffness, those are two and three. So infection is, is a separate issue. We do our best to control that. Bacteria have been around much longer than we have and they're very, very smart and we can't control them always. And we're actively working on that. But stiffness and instability, the second and third leading causes are direct surgical technical errors. So that can be addressed. And we do education all the time trying to get people to do the operation better. But Surgeons are, are just like everybody else. They're human, so. Yes? It's my impression that the more procedures a physician does, the better they are at it. Do we, as patients, have a way to find out how many procedures a surgeon does a year of a particular operation? Um, so right now, no. Uh, I showed you the California Joint Replacement Registry. So eventually, you probably will be able to. 
Okay, you'll be able to see certainly, hopefully soon, how many procedures are done at the institution, and then you can see how many, uh, sur how many procedures by surgeon are done. So that, the payers would love that. They want to see that now. Um, eventually, it will be available to you. It's not now, at least in California. In, this, in Pennsylvania, it is. What about indirect methods, like look at PubMed for how much they publish, or is there a method you'd recommend for identifying the really active people in the field? Yeah, so um, the active people in the field are, are not secrets. So what I recommend to you is ask the surgeon themselves. So. Are you good? <laughs> You'd be very surprised what comes out of people's mouths. But, but so I, I would literally just ask the surgeon, and they'll tell you. Yeah so, yeah, so the question is, why in the data that I showed you wasn't orthopedics green all the time? So the good news is, is for the last four quarters, I think, we have been green. Okay, so there are many drivers of that score. It's very complicated methodology, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to drill it down to you in a sound bite. Um, uh, but there are provider uh, parts of it, okay, both uh, the doctor, there are nursing parts of it, and then there are facility parts of it. So there are a lot of things that go into it, okay. some of which we as providers can control, some of which we can't. Great, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yes? Uh, recently, uh I saw something in the paper about the process that Stanford was developing. That in lieu of a replacement, this was another process, something like microfracture or something. Uh, maybe you could you comment on that or are you aware of something? Um, so nothing that's ready for prime time at the moment, all right? Uh, the, holy gra the holy grail is the use of stem cells to fill in cartilage defects or arthritis, right? Lots and lots of people have been working on it for a long time and it's not ready for prime time but we're getting there. But you're not going to see it in the next five years. The problem is, the, one of the biggest problems, we think we know how to do it, is the regulatory hurdles to do it. Okay, it's going to cost a, a company about $20 million to do it. And a young company starting doesn't have that money to do it. And they can't stay alive from a funding perspective long enough to get through all the regulatory burdens. And that's unfortunately the sad truth today. Yes? You mentioned the increase life of this plastic spacer and the hip has improved as a result of processing of the plastic. Roughly what point in time did this processing change? Um, so <clears throat> there were many different bearing surfaces uh, tried originally. Teflon was one of them, titanium was one of them. And then uh, the uh, original one that worked well, uh, which was pioneered by a gentleman named Sir John Charlie, who, who worked in Wrightington in the UK, uh, was ca it's called ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. And ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene is a great bearing surface, but when it gets exposed to oxygen, it wears out. And when it, when it gets oxidized, so to speak, it becomes more brittle and it doesn't wear as well. Okay? So the first change that happened, uh, and this was in about uh, the early 90s, was to package it in an inert environment. So there's no oxygen where, it's, where it goes from where it's made until it goes into the patient. There's no oxygen then exposed to it, okay? So not having exposure to oxygen made it last longer. So that was the first big improvement, okay? Once it goes into the body, it gets exposed to oxygen, and that starts the oxidation process. So slowly the material breaks down and it wears uh, more, and then the joint replacement wears out. So the most recent thing we've done is dope the material with natural antioxidants. And the idea is, is that not only being packaged in an inert environment where it's not exposed to oxygen, will it ward off any interaction with oxygen. But once it gets in the body and exposed to oxygen in the body, now the antioxidant that's in the material can scavenge that oxygen. So we have uh, finished enrollment as of last year in uh, the, we call it the second generation plastic, essentially, um, that's doped with vitamin E, which is a natural antioxidant. And uh, I was the principal investigator for that study. And we have 1,000 patients at eight different sites in the United States and, and about, I think, six sites internationally uh, that we're going to follow for at least 10 years. So uh, we have uh, over 300 patients out to three years, and the material looks good. It's going to take us a long time to see uh, the benefits of doping the material with antioxidants. Uh, uh, but hopefully we'll get to that point. Between those two, okay, the original plastic and then the packaging it in an inert environment, the biggest change was what we call cross-linking the material. And that cross-linking process essentially made the material more resistant uh, to wearing out. Does that help? The last comment, the last change, when was that? Um, so the timeline was, so 
cross-linked polyethylene happened in about 1980, sorry, 1998 or 1999, okay? Um, and then just recently in the last four years have we started working on the antioxidants. So the antioxidants are now, it's cross-linked polyethylene that's doped with the vitamin E. Yes? How do you revolt? Some people might have to revolt because they were people trying to uh, limit who would have access. So what are some good ways to revolt? So your legislators are one good way. Okay, they're there for you. They're not always the most efficient, but that's why they're here. Okay, so that's one good way. Okay, and the other way is to revolt through your insurance companies. So the insurance company always wants to deny you services that you've already paid for. That's one of their primary strategies. And we as providers have to do that, okay? But the strongest way to revolt against the, uh, pay against the insurance companies is on a class action basis. And unfortunately, that requires organization, okay? But that's what it's gonna, uh, is going to have to happen. They don't listen to us. We're the bad guys. We drive the cost, supposedly. And so how did you ever hear about a class action uh, brewing somewhere? Yeah. So you have to start one. Yeah, you have to start one. <laughs> but you've probably heard about some of them. About, you know, so there'll be great improvements with Obamacare to start, right? So you know, there'll be no more denial of pre-existing conditions. Okay? After college, kids can stay on the dole, so to speak, for a longer period of time. Um, on their parents' insurance. So there are improvements already coming, but there will always be things that they're trying to do to deny you services, okay? And if it gets to the point where they say that uh, you have a body mass index of 36, and if your body mass index isn't 35 or less, your joint replacement is gonna wear out sooner than it should, therefore you can't have the operation. When it gets to that, if it does, that's the time that you need to organize. It's coming, unfortunately, it is coming. Last question. Is the cost of malpractice insurance significant compared to the overall cost? Um, it is. So I can't give you the numbers, uh, but there's no question that defensive medicine is a major driver of the cost of care. Um, California has had a ban on non, uh, sorry, a cap, I should say, of $250,000 on non-economic damages um, since 1970. And as a result, uh, the litigation here is much less than it is in many other parts of the country. That being said, it's still a major cost of care. So what percentage, I don't know. Uh, I've seen various estimates, but I don't want to misquote any of them. So it is a large part, OK? Uh, I forget what the, most, uh, the strongest lobbies in Congress are, OK? Uh, but the lawyers are uh, in the top three. I know that for a fact.